Let me just tell you that there is, is great preparation that goes into what I'm teaching, exposing, and preaching on tonight. So I want you to understand that the enemy is in no way, shape, or form pleased with what we're going to expose tonight. If there is anything that needs exposure, it's the dark places. The Bible say in Hosea that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Oftentimes, I, I feel like we're trying to go places with no revelation. We're trying to go places that need illuminated because we need to really factor in where the steps are we're going to be taking to get where we're going. And so having said that, we're going to shed some light tonight on some scripture. I pray that we'll bless you, comfort you, encourage you, and give you great strength and great peace in the time that you are living in and the season in which we are in. Thank God for Jesus tonight. Come on. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. These networks, these people are going to worship who they worship. But tonight we are going to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And beside him there is no other. There is no other. I want to go tonight to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through, 1 through 15. 2 Corinthians 11. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Would to God you would bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. For I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means this the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles, but though I be rude in speech, yet in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted because I've preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. When I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I've kept myself from being burdensome unto you and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that will I do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Boy, 13 and 14 and 15 will grab you real good by the, by the arm, won't it? For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Thank you, God, for your goodness tonight. Thank you for your blessings over us, and thank you for your goodness. And Father, we will thank you and give you all the praise in the name that is above every name. And everybody ought to shout amen. amen. And amen. Let's give God some praise tonight in the house of the Lord. Everybody, while you're standing, just kind of turn around and shake hands, high five somebody. Look at them and say, I'm in agreement that God is going to move tonight. Praise God, praise God. I had an opportunity over last Friday night to preach down around Batavia, Ohio, Cincinnati proper, really. And so 
I wanted to say thank you to all the precious people that were able to sacrifice your Friday night and come down. It was a tremendous service. Great pastor, great friends, and just thankful to be a part of it. When I woke up that morning, I could not get away from this passage. When I started teaching the spiritual warfare series, I just felt like that it, it was so prevalent and it was the predominant thought in my mind and on my heart that I went there and I preached on spiritual warfare, not the series in totality, but just a par- portion of it, a part of it. So when I got up that morning, I started reading and studying just a little bit about it. And then I get to the place where while I'm studying, one of the screens pop up and it talks about war with China. And when it talks about war with China, it, it goes into the fact that there is the potential and, you know, there's all kinds of stuff on the Internet. You know how that goes. But they, but they had a general, Jack King, he's a four-star general, and he came on and they were asking him questions about what if this happened. So General Keene is talking and he's taking questions and he's answering them. This is what he said to me because not only did he say it by video, but he also said it to the point where everything was scripted that, that he said. In other words, you could read it or you could listen to it. When I read it, I had to read it again and read it again because I thought how, how, the, how this parallels with spiritual warfare. Here's what General Jack King said. He said, in times of peace, all branches must prepare for war. By doing so, you are deterring war. This is what a general said. He said, you prepare for war in times of peace. Think about that. Now, here's the problem with the body of Christ. I don't mean to preach at you right out of the gate, but I feel my help coming right here. Here's the problem with the body of Christ. Notoriously, we do this. We go to battle when we've been fired upon. We retaliate when things happen to us. We go into prayer when things get shaky. We go into warfare when we've been attacked. We get our Bible and get a verse when we're missing something. And... Most commonly, we prepare for war when war hits. And when the general said that, I thought to myself, how many Christian people grab a scripture before you ever needed a scripture? How many people ever study a topic that you're not familiar with, even though you're not asked about a topic that you should have been familiar with? How many times do we pray only when we really have to pray? How many times do we find ourselves in a prayer closet when our family's under attack or somebody we love is in the hospital? And so therefore, war hits and we retaliate when we feel necessary to do so after the fact that we've been fired upon or we've been hit or we have felt the pressure of warfare. I want to say tonight, it is absolutely imperative that you study your Bible every single day, whether you feel warfare Whether you're going through warfare or everything is fine and you are living in times of peace, you need to grab your Bible and get that Bible out and number one, pray that God will help you open it to the right place. And when you begin to read something that doesn't line up with your lifestyle at the very moment, it's the very thing God is trying to show you. And when you read things that prick at you a little bit or convict your heart or your mind or your life a little bit, it's the very thing that the Spirit of God helped push you in that direction so that you could read that and have revelation in your heart and life. And more than anything, saints of God, it's not for you to feel bad that I got caught doing something. It's that God wants to give exposure to you so you can get free from that thing. That's what's more important. To me, it's never about whether they got caught and how it happened. It's that you got freedom after you got that thing off your chest. Hallelujah, everybody. Come on now. So I want to tell everybody in times of peace, that's when you prepare. When should we prepare? Every day, all the time. We should always be ready for warfare. And even when we're not in warfare, we should study like we're in warfare. We should pray like we're in warfare. And we should pray that God gives us the wherewithal to ascertain his understanding and know what we're going to do and how we're going to respond. Because when warfare hits, we will not be caught off guard. When warfare comes to our house, we will not be surprised. We will jump up and prepare for it. Hallelujah. 
I haven't said anything about this because I've been very protective of what happened here in December with my family about midnight one night. I was in bed. My wife was in bed. We were upstairs and Carly was downstairs. She was with her dog and she must have been watching some program up through midnight and all of a sudden she runs upstairs and she said, Dad, someone is turning the doorknob on the front door. Someone is trying to push our door open. And my phone was, was on silent and so I, the first thing I did was I picked it up because I wanted to see what I'm dealing with. Come on, everybody, help me. I wanted to see who it was I'm dealing with. And when I saw who it was I was dealing with and that they twisted the knob and shouldered into it two times, grunting, trying to push my door down. And I thought, I'm not real concerned about me, but I've got a wife and I got my baby in this house. And so a series of things happened when I got up out of bed. I started grabbing things, and, and I'm, I'm putting shoes on on the way out the door. And my wife is saying, where are you going? And I said, to the threat. That's where I'm going. Come on, everybody. I mean to tell you, we have never practiced that before. I have never told Carly to come up at midnight, tell me someone's there, and I'm going to go through the motions of what I'm going to do. But let me tell you something. When you get in a moment where you have to respond to it, naturally you just grab up things you know you're going to need for warfare because they're not going to harm my family. Come on, everybody. Thank God the story ended very well, very well. Thank you, Lord. And, and I went outside, and I'll tell you what weapon I had, my phone. Hallelujah. That's all I had. And, and the, the girls locked the doors, ran to the windows, and, and started praying for Daddy and thought, what is he doing? And so I'm on the phone outside with a 911 operator, and uh, I'm, I'm telling you, it's a really, really sweet feeling when you're in the middle of the road, it's about 20 degrees, and you have two cop cars with sirens and lights coming straight at you, and you're, you're caught right in between, and I thought, I'm safe now. Come on, Jesus. How many of you know when you've been in warfare before and you feel the presence of God and his angels show up aiding and abetting you and helping you, there is a comfort that's over you. But my point is this, we should all be prepared at any time to get a phone call that someone's under pressure, that someone's in a battle, or you'll never know when you get that phone call and you are directly impacted and involved with it. And so I'm telling you in times of preparation, when nothing is going on, you can learn to get a scripture about the peace of God. In times when everything is going and good that you can collect up some Bible that gives you peace and hope in the time of your storms that when you can just study and prepare yourself that God no matter what happens I will trust you that's important let me go on and say that, that General, General King said we have currently lost our deterrence it has eroded over the past wars budgets but mostly from this this is what surprised me this is what he said he said it's past wars, it's budget, it's money. And when he started talking about this, he said this at the very last. And he said to follow it up, he said, there is no commitment from anyone that wants to prepare for war. No one wants to join the army. No one wants to go in the Marines. No one wants to get on a boat in the Navy. No one wants to fly a plane in the Air Force. And I know Marines do too and Navy does and I get all that. I understand that. But let me tell you something, saints of God. No one is standing in line for war. And as much as I say that tonight, there's not a long line of people that sign up and want to come in and say, let me pray heaven down with you because our church is in warfare. Let me pray heaven down with you because our, my family's in warfare. Let me pray heaven down with you because this whole world is in turmoil and warfare. Now, now, saints, y'all know my heart, so I'm not pushing on you to come to a prayer meeting. I would encourage that. But I want you to understand that it's just not at a prayer meeting. Not everybody can come to those, so I get it. I understand completely. Do not feel influenced that way, not now. What I want to get at you is you've got to find time at home that you're praying. You've got to find that time. You've got to find that time to pray. You've got to listen to what God's saying, and I would never go into my prayer closet without something to write with and something to write on. Never. Because the minute I get in my prayer closet, within two minutes of praying, the Lord will start to reveal things to me. And I cannot take for granted that when I get out of here, I'm going to remember 50 things that God just dropped in my spirit. So you've got to take a pen and piece of paper with you in there. Do it. 
Do it every time. I do not pick up my phone and make notes because I find somebody text me or there's an email or there's something I forgot to do for a reminder. And I'm just telling you, saints of God, just go in there with old-fashioned manual pen and paper and write it down. Something else that's extremely important is journal. You have to journal. Write stuff down. I've journaled the Bible five or six times, the entire Bible. Now, I'm not being arrogant about that whatsoever. Let me tell you what I do. I, I take one verse of that chapter and I write that down, the verse that pops off the page for me. And I've gone through the whole Bible and read it and done that for all of my kids. Carly's is almost done. So I want to say to you tonight, it's important to write it down. Once a week, I come into my office and I have a thick leather folder. Inside of it is a journal. I open that up and I have years of journaling in there. And I tell my journal how the church is doing, what my plans are next. Stay away from my journal. <laughs> it's got all my secrets in it for 53-year-olds. Amen. Amen. It's important to do that. It's important to track what God is doing in your life because you, when you get to looking at that, someday somebody is going to pick that treasure trove up. I'm saying most likely my family and they're going to say we can glimpse into dad's life from his pencil. And so it's very important that I can look back at that as well and I can see things God did that I might have forgot down through the years. We've got to get our commitment back, saints of God. Be serious about it. We've got to get our commitment of prayer back. If you are going to make it, it's because you're praying to make it. General went on to say that China does have most of the advantage. He did go on to say that with planes, with weapons, from ships, and he listed a few more things that went on from there. Having said that now, I want to expose our enemy for you. I want to talk about Lucifer. O Daystar, how hast thou fallen from heaven? And that is in the book of Isaiah. But if you go to the book of Ezekiel, you'll find in Ezekiel chapter number 28, I want to start there, and let's just look at verses 13 to 19. Verse 13 says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets, of thy pipes were prepared in thee of the day thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created. Then we find out what happened. Till iniquity was found in thee. Now, if you read all of chapter number 28, it's called the law of, 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 of double reference. Let me make sure I get this right. Thank you, Jesus. It's the law of double reference. So if you look at chapter number 28, you will see in verse number two, just read it real quick. I'm just gonna push on you a little bit. I'm gonna challenge you. I'm gonna leave you to do the study in here. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, thou hast said, I am a God. You will find a lot of parallels from the son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus. You will find parallels with this prince of Tyrus and you will also find them with Lucifer. How he was created, pride got him, iniquity was found in him. This, this prince of Tyrus, prince of Tyre, you'll find if you do a lot of studies, you go a little deep with it, that's what you're going to find. It's, it's the law of double reference. Here's the easiest way for me to explain this to you when you read this later. Anything on the earth is talking about the prince of Tyre. Anything that happens in the heavenlies is talking about Lucifer. It's that simple. That is the easiest way to keep these two separated. They will run together, it seems like, but you will pick up the difference from up here to down here. Is everybody still with me? Because your heart is lifted up and you said that you're a God. Lucifer is a brilliant star, a day star, shining one, the Hebrew is, of what we've described. Ezekiel 28, 13 and 19, which we read about Lucifer, all of this explanation about him, his creation had come to this. The beauty of what God had made, his tabrets, his pipes. Now you will hear a lot of people talk about his pipes because they're, 
There is some question. There is some uncertainty, if you will. And, and I, I only say un, uncertainty because there's a lot of people that will give you different viewpoints on it. And so personally, I would have to think if he's beautiful, if he was created this way, he, he, was, he was an anointed cherub. He was a protector of God's glory, one theologian wrote. And, and as I, and I, I've studied this, and I, I literally, I was telling Brother Nick earlier, I literally added three little paragraphs to my, to my already four pages of Spiritual Warfare Series notes, and just getting those to make sure I had it accurate, to make sure before I went before the internet and I came before our church, that three to four hours of study, you can ask my wife, to pass midnight last night at 6.15 this morning, this starts stirring in my heart and mind so I can get this for us. I'm digging in there to try to get it for us so we can expose what is really going on. But the pipes to me are a singer, a lot of them say. A lot of different opinions, I should say. When I, sh when I say they, I mean opinions because opinions vary here. There's some things we do know and then there's some things we're left that's, that's a mystery and we kind of prayerfully uh, take a stab at what it really means. So let me keep going. Isaiah 14 and 12. Here's the question in the book of Isaiah. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Here he's called son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? God created Lucifer just as all angels were created. But his role was different from the other angelic host. Lucifer was, re was referred to as the covering angel. And I think if I'm not mistaken, I mentioned that. A little bit ago. The problem was in Ezekiel 28 and 15, it tells the rest of the story. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. The iniquity that Lucifer had ends up being this word that all of us know, that all of us have dealt with, or if you've never had to deal with it, I, I applaud that, but you've probably dealt with it in other people, and it's called the spirit of pride. And pride has a haughty spirit, and pride has arrogance, and pride, ha pride is the thing that drives a very religious spirit. It is easier for me, I've said this dozens of times in my life, that it is easier to deal with a drunk than it is a person with a religious spirit. Because a person with a religious spirit is not going to back down. They are not wrong about what they assume the scripture to be accurate about. You cannot speak to them. You cannot talk to them. They are so educated but have no power in the spirit at all. They can call on the name of the Lord, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? That's what the enemy said to them, jumped on them and they ran. If you want to be truthful, ran naked away from him. Can I keep on preaching right here? Saints of God, you have to understand when pride gets in there, someone is in trouble. I've heard people make this statement, I don't care what your Bible says, this is how I was raised. I don't care what your Bible says. This is how my dad taught it. This is how my family taught it. I don't care what your Bible says. The Bible is your final authority. That's it. This will prove to be right every single time. This will prove me to be wrong every time when I think I'm right. And this will prove me to be right if by the scriptures I've got it right. This is your Bible. This is your roadmap. This is your compass. This is your help. This is your manifesto. When pride comes in, it causes people to sit still and lock up and never be humble in their life. I've always prayed, God, let me humble me before you have to do it. Because you do not want pride in your life. Pride will keep you swelled up. Pride will keep you full of confidence and ego. Pride will get you prepared for your fall. Pride will get you prepared for embarrassment. Pride will mess you up every single day of the week. Learn to say, I'm sorry. Learn to say, I didn't mean to come across that way. Learn to say, I made a mistake. Can I have some grace and mercy? Learn to say, let's get through this. But whatever you do, saints of God, do not let that pride get a hold of you. 
Just say you're sorry. Just make it right with your family. Come on, I don't have time to preach all that tonight, but I'm just telling you in short, please, from my heart, my pastor's heart to yours, get it right with your family. Get it right with your friends. Go out there and talk to your neighbor. Walk across the street and say, I had a bad day that day. I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry I said that. I want to make this right. You will be bigger when you get on your knees than you are standing there in your pride. You will be bigger in your humility than you standing there as if you're right all the time. You'll be a bigger person. Hallelujah. Oh goodness, do I go there right now or do I not? This is spiritual warfare. Come on saints, it's spiritual warfare. Y'all wanna get free tonight? Y'all wanna help other people get free? Let them know they got to let it go. They got to let it go. I'm not gonna let the president jack with me. I'm not gonna let Hollywood jack with me. I'm not going to let the old president jack with me. I'm not going to let the vice president jack with me. I'm not going to let the senators and the congressmen jack with me. I'm not going to let the speaker of the house mess my joy up. Saints of God, this is spiritual warfare. And when you feel the emotion of bitterness and pain, and you feel the bitterness and the frustration come in, and you get mad at politicians, it's a spirit. It's a spirit sent right to your house to try to derail you, detain you, and distract you, my goodness. Can I keep on preaching? Spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. Come on, spiritual warfare. Don't let it happen. Don't let the enemy use your family to jack your life up. Don't you let the enemy use your extended family to mess your life up. You just trust God that everything I'm going through, I got to go through. I can't complain about what I've been through. I can't change it now. All I can do is live from it and say there are things I will not repeat and there are things I will repeat. There's things I'm not going to do, places I'm not going to go. And God, by your help and by your direction, we're going to do something absolutely incredibly phenomenal for the kingdom of the Lord. Woo! My God, I thought I was going to teach a little bit, but I already feel like preaching. Oh, let's take a praise break. Would that be all right, everybody? Drop your notes and clap your hands and shout, Preach on, Pastor. Woo! You ever notice, Michael, if there's one thing the enemy knows how to do, he knows how to put pride in people. Because, man, he will come to you when you're mad and when you're frustrated, and he will tell you, you are right there wrong. You better not back up on it. You better not let them disrespect you. Come on, everybody. <laughs> there are precious little people that walk in this church that know nothing about respect. And you can't turn around and get disrespected every time, every time you come to church because someone's not respecting me. You're going to have to get out of your flesh. <laughs> come on, everybody. People come to church and say, hey, Father Todd. And I go, hey. <laughs> hey brother Hoskins <laughs> hey dude <laughs> listen get out of yourself it's okay there's people that are going to come in here that don't realize that they're in a Pentecostal church that they're in a non-denominational church that they're in an independent church that they're in a church that believes in all nine gifts of the spirit and pray that the Holy Ghost will manifest and that the Holy Ghost will use you by giving you one of the gifts. It's a gift, it's a gift, it's a gift. So please understand how the enemy really knows about pride. Why? Because it was the original. Can I get a witness in the house? That, that, was, that was perfect in that ways. You have to understand he had everything, had it all, and let it go. Let's keep going. When we talk about Lucifer... The Bible talks, when it speaks of Lucifer here, that you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, beautiful. You were in Eden, the garden of God. So now we have a time frame. We know where he was. We know when it was. Every precious stone was his covering. We named all of those stones. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. What a singer he must have been. And, and you will see that most that talk about those pipes being his voice, that, that you will hear a lot of them go on to say that, wow, what a, what a voice he had. And so he dominates music industry that way. 
You will hear that. Just so, I'm just giving you something to study. You study that. You dig into it. Just giving you something to think about. Lucifer wanna be, wanted to be worshipped like God. And this is how we have to be careful. This is why some people, you cannot give them power. This is why some people do not need your nod of approval. This is why not everybody can, given, can be given certain positions because it, they cannot handle the power. It goes right to their head. Anybody seen somebody win something and all of a sudden it changes their life immensely because they cannot handle the power. They cannot handle the power. You've got to be careful. Todd Hoskins has to be careful all the time that I pay real close attention to the critics and let the praise roll off my back. Why is that? Because a dead clock is accurate two times a day. That's not in my notes. I'm just throwing that out there to tell you, not everything your critics are saying about you is unfair, it's not right, it's a lie. There's some of it, they're hitting it pretty accurate. <laughs> Can I keep on preaching tonight, saints? <laughs> Come on, I'm enjoying this now, because I'm helping somebody. Stop, stop hating on your haters. Let your haters be your elevators. So you take what they say, Use it a little bit. If it fits, put the shoe on. If it doesn't, kick it to the curb. Donate them to Goodwill. Keep on pressing. Do something great for God. Come on. Come on. The office doesn't let everything get to me. But there have been times I have seen things. I have read things and it caused me to think. It didn't mess me up real bad. I can hear a compliment, and they're good to have, by the way. Don't, don't stop the compliments. I appreciate every little compliment I get. I promise you I do. I appreciate it. Because, thank you, because oftentimes, I heard you, Mary Jane. Is Mary Jane in here? Man, I knew that was your voice before I even looked over there and seen you were here, Mary Jane. I, I just knew that Atlanta love you passed. I knew it was you. Man, come on. And so, see how compliments can kind of throw you off a little bit, huh? <laughs> I love you, Pastor. Just messed the whole sermon up. Because times that you feel your critics say things, sometimes, sometimes it's noteworthy. Sometimes it will get through the crevices and get to me. And I'll get to read it and look at it, and I'll say, they, didn't, they don't know me. They don't, they don't have, this is not accurate. But, I, but based on their assessment, I can see why they might have felt that way. A lot of people look at me as my boldness and, and my, um, <laughs> my enthusiasm and my aggression at times. And, and they see all of that and they go, wow, whew, Lord, he, you know, he's, uh, he, uh, never mind, I won't say it. But they don't know my heart. They don't know my heart. They, they don't know me when the cameras go off and the cameras shut down and the live stream goes down. They don't see me down here. And that, that I, that, 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 that's that pastor side. Up here, there's a boldness in the word of God that wants to teach you and help you to get through some stuff in your life. Can I keep on going? Can I keep going? Lucifer wanted to be worshipped. Everybody, everybody likes to be doted on a little bit. I don't want to say worshipped. It sounds, it sounds a little too, uh, too tough, too harsh. But people, people like to be loved on. People like to be told, oh, you look good, baby. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. I'm talking about that's what I say to my wife. <laughs> Amen. He had wisdom, beauty, ability, perfection, and yet wanted more. He wanted to be worshipped like God. Here's what got him from Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 15. I won't go there, but I'm telling you this. There are five I wills. I will. I will. Pride is a killer. Everybody say pride is a killer. I will read verse number 13 because we're getting ready to go somewhere and this is going to change the trajectory of what we're doing. And this is, this is where it gets good because I'm going to show you some stuff that you may not be aware of. Isaiah 14 and verse 13. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. Okay, so we know here he is, Lucifer, O day star, anointed cherub, covering angel. Here he is and here's what he says. 
I'm so beautiful. I'm so good. I sound so great. Look at how bright. Look how wonderful. He says, I will ascend into heaven. There is a key that's about to come up that's going to unlock a mystery and show you something in Isaiah. I will ascend into heaven, and here's where it gets good. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So where is he going? There's atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere. There's the atmosphere between earth and the stars. That's an atmosphere. That's the second atmosphere. That's the second heaven Uh, second atmosphere and then you've got the third atmosphere which is heaven which one does the enemy work in he's the prince of the power of the air so he's up here in this one he's in the middle that's why he said I'm walking up and down and to and fro in the earth that's when he came up and he said what about Job because he he apparently at one point had access to go in And I'm just going to throw this out as a side note. It's not in my notes. But how did he get into the throne? How did he get to God? How did he pass by everybody that was there? There's no sidebar conversations about look who it is. Look who just walked in. How did he get in front of God and start accusing Job to him? How did it happen? He was something. Remember what he was. Did he put on another display and get there? To me, it's a bit of a mystery. But it just, it's just worth bringing up to give you something more to think about. I'm not going to tell you all of my thoughts because I want you to think about things. <laughs> Plus, I want to be, be extremely accurate. So we get that he says, I want to go up and I want to ascend above the heavens. I go above the stars and here comes the key. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Why did he say, that's where I'm going to go? He said, I'm going to go into heaven, go above the stars, and I'm going to go into the sides of the north. Where is God's throne? Where is it located? It's in the north. It's in the north. I'm going to keep going. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now, when we look to Ezekiel chapter 28, we read that, we understand what happened there, so we won't go back to that, but let's go to this. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The Bible does not say that pride goes before a fall. You hear people say that all the time. That is not the Bible. Everybody say amen. amen. Come on, if, if you're gonna quote it, so it's, 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 it's semi-accurate, but that's, that's not the scripture. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit goes before a fall. So if you want to get it right, it's a haughty spirit before a fall. Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Hallelujah. Had to throw all that in there. Now, let's go back to God's throne is in the north. Are you ready for some stuff? How significant is it, y'all ready, that the geographic and magnetic poles of the earth are always kept pointing north? Does it ever amaze you that you can pick a compass up and the needle always heads directly north? Why does it, how does that happen? We did not do that. We did not come up with that. We just, we just when, the, when the compass was invented, whoo, The needle just flows right directly to the north. Have you ever wondered how that happens? And so who can tell why it is when it always goes toward the north star? Ezekiel 1 and 4. Ezekiel 1 and 4. I'm just going to keep pounding information at you. You ready? Ezekiel 1 and 4. And I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. That's Ezekiel 1 verse 4. A great cloud, a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof as the color of amber out of the midst of fire. There it is. Where did all this come from? Out of the north. Everybody shout the north. Okay, you want me to throw something else at you because I have time. This is interesting. There's still another point of tremendous interest in connection with this study. In the northern heavens... The telescope camera, because they put the Hubble telescope there, reveals an apparently empty space where there are no stars. Though the region all around is thickly dotted with them, some astronomers say that this is a rift in the sky. It may be wondered, this is what people say, it may be wondered if the Holy Spirit had any reference to this when he recorded in Job 26.7, he, 
God stretch out the north over the empty place and hanged the earth upon nothing. Woo! Come on, everybody. All right, you want me to keep going? The world system. As a ruler of the world system, which is organized according to the devil's schemes, procedures, and goals, there are multiple, multitudes of, of, of wiles. When I say wiles, I go to Ephesians. But wiles means methodi, M-E-T-H-O-D-I-A-S, I believe. And it's where we get the word methods. It's his methods. He wants to distract us, detain us, and defeat us as believers. That's Ephesians 6 and 10 to 12. Let's go to Ephesians 6 and 12 really quick. Let me hurry because I think I can do it. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I don't know why this, Brother Gary, this just hit me right in my chest. Like, man, right there. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Why has this hit me like this like it's never hit me before? Spiritual wickedness in high places. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Spiritual wickedness in high And I started thinking about that, and I thought about, okay, wait a minute. He's the prince of the power of the air. We always think he's a low-down devil. He's a low-down devil. He's not messing with anything that's already low and gutted and can't do anything, and that's already dead. He is the prince of the power of the air. He is working up here. It is no wonder that the closer you get to God and the closer that you get to heaven, it is really tough in that atmosphere at times. Why is that? I believe because the enemy is in the atmosphere. He hears the prayers that are getting pushed through the app. Come on, everybody. He sees the praise that is getting pushed through the atmosphere. He sees the worship that is worthy, that goes up through the atmosphere. Oh, come on, everybody. He knows the, pra- he knows the higher you get, the more you're not worried about what is down here. He knows the closer you get to him, the less you're concerned about the mess you may have to put up with here. Woo. Come on, shout high places. Shout high places. Let me say this too. If if you go to foreign, if you go to foreign entities, you go to foreign countries, when you go into the city where the money is, what do they build? Skyscrapers. The poor do not live up here. Come on, everybody. The poor do not live up here. They don't live up here. They don't live in the high rise. They don't get the, the condo on the 12th floor looking over Central Park in New York. That's millions of dollars for that place. Do y'all, do y'all see where I'm going? High places. High places. People enjoy looking down. People enjoy looking over. Nothing wrong with that as long as it don't get to working on this and pride and what I have and high places. Come on, everybody. Stay with me. That's why God always blesses the humble. God always blesses those that have humility. In the book of James chapter 1, he said, if you want pure religion, he said, pure religion and undefiled is this. And it hit me like a ton of bricks the other day. He said, visit the fatherless and the widows. Visit the fatherless. And you guys know my heart for the widows and widowers in this church. You know what we do. You know that we do uh, telecare for them. Every month, we try to call every widow and check on them, love on them, and make sure they're okay. But I was reading just last week, and the Lord spoke to me about visiting the fatherless. And I I looked at that scripture, Brother Tony, and it hit me, and the Lord spoke to me. And all I could see was all the little kids at the apartment complexes that we dropped the toys off at. That the mamas ran with the little boys, and mamas and aunts ran with the little kids because there was no daddy in their life. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said to me, son, that's exactly who I'm talking about. Those kids are the ones that are fatherless. I want you to visit them. I want you to make sure they're taken care of, just like you make sure the widows are you go take care of them as well come on everybody God will bless you when you're humble he picks you up when you get down he exalts you in due time when you abase yourself and be humble you'll always win when you're humble my God I didn't get to preach tonight but I feel it coming on now hey man I'm pastor they don't have to know who I am They don't have to know my name. They don't have to call me pastor, reverend, bishop, preacher, apostle, whatever. I appreciate the honor. 
I appreciate the humble honor to do what I do. But man, I just want Jesus to know who I am. I just want him to know who I am. I just want him to see me busy staying low that in due time somebody is going to get... Oh, Lord Jesus, we've been in some warfare. Come on. God's going to help us. Ephesians 1 and 3. But I want you to think about how much goes on in high places. How many of these deals go on in high places? They don't go in basements to make deals. They go in high places to make deals. Come on. They go in the ritzy parts. They go with the fancy stuff. and They go to the high places. Come on, Jesus, help me right here. Ephesians 1 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Who blesses us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Why do I want to go to heavenly places? Because I get all spiritual blessings from the Father in heavenly places. I'm going to heavenly places, not because I think, oh Lord, I'm going to be fought by the devil. No, 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 no. When I go where I got to go, God is going to go with me. And it's going to be God that gives me access to it. It's going to be God that takes me up to heavenly places. And it's going to be God that I dwell with in heavenly places. So do not sit down here because I don't want to go there. I've got a fight on my hands. No, 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 no. You're not fighting the battle. God's fighting the battle for you. You give the battle to God and he'll hand you the victory. The enemy cannot stand to tolerate our high places in the heavenlies. Ephesians 1.3, right there. You need to, you need to make, make a note. Ephesians 1.3. We're going in heavenly places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, in the, that's way up in the atmosphere. The enemy cannot stand to tolerate our high places in the heavenlies or heavenly places. When we dwell there, so I got a little note. I just wanted to yell at you real quick, but I'm not going to yell tonight. Keep on climbing, Christians. <laughs> all right. Keep on climbing, Christians. Is that all right? 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen 13 to 15. I want to talk about counterfeit Christians real quick. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel, transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their earthly works, to what they did here. You'll get your reward, but it'll be here. And there are a lot of people that have a little bit of Bible knowledge. There are a lot of people that are accurate a little bit theologically. And they think they have the power to push around people that aren't as theologically attuned as they are. Uh huh. And they have no spirit. They have no spirit. They want nothing to do with the spirit. All they want, and all they want is part of this education to be enough that they can have a little power to be false. God, I feel my help to preach right here. And there's a lot of, I want somebody who's got the spirit. Don't you tell me the spirit of God is not an operation. If that's the case, dear sir or ma'am, then you need to take the book of Acts completely out of your Bible that the Gentile writer, Brother Luke wrote, you might as well get rid of it. But I come to tell you, you can't get rid of what God already ordained and that already has happened. Transformation is a marked change in appearance or character, usually for the better. So what they do is they put on this, this air. The enemy does not approach you how you might think. He will transform himself into an angel of light. He will tell you how good it is to do that. He'll tell you how great it is, and it's okay, and no one's looking, and you're not going to get caught. And it's the very lawn that looks and sounds like what he used to be, but he's not, and you have to be careful. If he can't drag you out, he will build you up. For a fall. If he can't drag you out, he'll build you up for a fall. The enemy is subtle. The Hebrew, uh, from the Hebrew, I'll just cut to the chase. It means wise, skillful, or artful. Artful. The enemy can send frustrating people. Zerubbabel, Jeshua, the son of Yosedek, were building the house of the Lord in Ezra, but the people of the land hired counselors to frustrate their purpose. The enemy wants to send frustrators into the house of God, frustrators to your job, frustrators for your contracts, frustrators against the business that God's telling you, I'm going to bless you with. The, the, the grandpa's here raising grandbabies that God's going to bless you as you do it. The enemy wants to send frustrators in, but God is going to make a way where there seems to be no way at all. 
In closing, let me say you can sink by what you think. Many people will fail miserably because of what they think. What you think of yourself is what you become. Many people are molded by what they hear and say, hear and see. You must look beyond what you see and hear, and you got to press. You need the right people in your life, like Proverbs 20 and 18. Every purpose is established by counsel. I have told you, when you hear me preach, you hear other voices. When you see me, you see other people. When you see my response, you hear other people. People that have talked to that put their hands on me and said, here's what you're going to say. Here's what you need to do. Here's how you need to respond. You incorporate it into your personality, but you let the Spirit of God lead you. I've had great counsel on my life. We are in this building right here because someone stopped me years ago and said, start here. It's too big for you now. Start over here. So we tore down a house and built it in the parking lot, and we filled that up, and we started running two services on Sunday, still having our Sunday night. Then God gave us the land. Then we built over here when we couldn't do any more over there. Because I had the right people in my life that just happened to stop by on their way from Atlanta to Detroit, turn around in our parking lot and say, build it there. That's step number two. Step number three will be over there on the highway. And we didn't even have the land yet. I just told him, I want something on the highway. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I'm telling you, I'm a little young preacher and we didn't have the money to do it. Come on, everybody. But I stood in a parking lot where there was no Vandalia Christian Tabernacle in a steel building yet. And he looked at me and said, build the steel building here. Knock these houses down. Build it here. Make this all gravel. Build the foundation. Make it pretty. Make it nice. Stay here. This is step two. He will put you on the highway after you fill this up. And exactly what he said, which is what the desire of my heart was what God did. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody, push on your neighbor. Shout, he needs to keep preaching. You got you to have wise counsel, and that's why you can't put unwise stuff on Facebook. I see people putting stuff out there, and I'm like, man, that is not, that is not mature. That is not right. Some, I'm, I'm not telling you I'm all that, but I, I can tell you when it's not all that. <laughs> I'm not perfect, but I, I can tell you kind of when it's, it's going in the wrong direction. You got to watch what you say. You got to watch what you say. God help me, Jesus. Lord help me, Jesus. Ecclesiastes 3, 1, to everything there's a season, a time to every purpose under heaven. Did I make it? I made it. Hallelujah. 835, I made it. Let's give God praise. I made it. I made it. I made it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.